want to read to you out of Psalm 92. If you brought your Bibles, take them out. Psalm 92, if you didn't bring your Bibles, you can follow along on the screen. And um, we're going to start reading, starting in verse 12. Psalm 92. This is what it says. It says, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. I mean, I want to stay fresh and green when I'm old. I don't know about you. Proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no wickedness in him. I love these verses. I love that the church was God's idea that the church is not just this man-made thing, but that the church has always been in the heart of God and that there is a promise for all of those who are planted in the house of God. And so this morning, I want to talk to you from this thought, the planting process. Why don't you say it with me? The planting process. So we're going to pray and get started because I believe that God wants to speak to us today specifically to our lives. God, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you that you are good. We thank you this morning that there is breath in our lungs. We thank you that we have a place that we can call home, a place where we can come together as a family, remind ourselves of your goodness, remind ourselves as souls that you are strong, God, that you are for us, that there's more for our lives. God, we thank you, Jesus, that you are good. God, that you are faithful. And so this morning we come to you with open hearts, God, wanting to receive what you have for us, Jesus. We know that any and every time that we are in your presence, something will happen in our lives, God. That you're going to continue to change us, mold us, shape us, help us, God. So this morning we give your heart in this time, God, that you will continue to help us and move us forward. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, as I thought about the planting process, I... I was thinking about something about me that a lot of people find shocking. A lot of people learn this about me and they just go, oh, no. Because they think that most girls, all girls, are like this. But not me. And some people find it funny. Some people find it interesting. When I tell them I really, I don't like flowers or plants. And what I mean by, th by this is, I, I mean, I like flowers. Like whenever they're like planted somewhere and they're growing, they're cute. I like them. I like plants somewhere else. I just don't like to be gifted flowers or plants because they're a lot of work and they die. So, so I really, I just will prefer, Alex found out early in a relationship that I just will prefer you buy me a cupcake or something. I don't know. And so I wanted to be really nice about it, right, because he's just coming with flowers all the time, right, and he's expecting, uh, like, other girls that I would be like, oh, my gosh, it's so nice. And I'm like, <laughs> thank you. Like, I just, whatever. <laughs> and so one day I just decided, like, I just don't want to hurt your feelings, but don't waste your money. Just, like, buy me a chocolate bar. I don't know. Just buy me something that's not going to die because the reality is that keeping flowers and keeping plants alive is a process, like you've got to water them and you've got to know where to put them so they get the right kind of sunlight, amount of sunlight. Um, sometimes you need to know when to um, not water them. And I just don't have a green thumb and I forget. I forget so I kill everything. Um, a few years back, I was left in charge of the office plans. This is the worst mistake Oyaso has ever made in his life, who is leaving me in charge of the plants. So he tells me before he leaves, all you have to do, you got to water them, I don't know, once a week, twice a week, whatever. And then you've got to take them out and then leave them out for the day, put them back in. Just do this once or twice, not a big deal. A week goes by, Koyaso comes back. There is no, like, I think maybe one plant made it. Everything else died. I even somehow managed to kill the cactus that um, I was in charge of. I moved it and that thing just like, yeah. It's, it's bad. And so I'm just trying to avoid the process, right? The process that if I overwater them, I don't put enough water, I'm going to leave them out in the sun, they're going to die. And so what I did is because Alex and I really like tulips. Um, and if you ever have had tulips, purchased tulips, you know that after two days, they just kind of like, like they don't know what they're doing. They're just like, 
dying. And so you have to cut them and you have to make sure they're in the right kind of vase so at least you pretend they're not dying. And so I decided to research for some fake flowers. Don't judge me. I know fake flowers might not be the best idea. However, I will tell you, I found the realest, fakest flowers you've seen in your life. These things have fooled people. I I'm telling you. And so I'm just avoiding the process of having to take care of something. I don't have time for it. I don't want to do it. I forget. And I realize that this might be the same reason why some of us never get planted in the house of God. That this might be the same reason that when someone tells us, hey, it's time you get planted in the house. Immediately we think inconvenience. Immediately we think, I just don't want to go through the process. Immediately we think, this is not for me. I just don't have time for this. I was not made for this. And so we never get planted in the house of God. And I know that there are people that are new to church. Maybe this is your first, second, third, fourth time at church and you've been hearing us constantly talk about growth track and you're going to learn so much about yourself and you're going to make a difference. And you've heard us talk about connect groups and join a connect group, meet some people. You're going to find friendships and you're sitting back and you're saying, this is not for me. And you're a little bit doubtful thinking, I wonder if this is for someone like me. I wonder if this is just for certain kind of people. I don't think that they're going to enjoy being around someone like me. Maybe you're sitting back and saying, I wonder if maybe I should just keep coming in and out because I'm, I'm good this way. There's no commitment. I, there's no process. There's nothing I have to do. And there's even some Christians that they've been following Jesus for a long time and yet they only show up to church maybe once every three months. Maybe you only show up to church on Christmas and Easter, what we call the CEOs, Christmas and Easter only. Maybe you are the kind of Christian that you've been, you've been jumping from place to place. And if we can be real, it's because once it begins to get a little uncomfortable somewhere, once we, we start thinking about a little bit of commitment, we have to run to the other place. And we've never allowed ourselves to get our roots and our feet planted in the house of God. And let me tell you something today. I really believe that there is nothing more that the enemy would want from your life and for your life, that for you to never be planted in the house of God, for you to never find out what it is that God has and wants for you. And so we don't commit to dream team, we don't commit to growth track, we don't commit to connect groups, we don't commit to anything because we keep thinking and the enemy will continue to feed us these lies, telling us this is not for you, that they're going to start asking you things and they're going to start telling you you need to do something and this is not for you because look at them, this is for people that have their lives all together, you don't. And the enemy will come into our minds and start telling us, you're going to have to show up on Sundays and you don't have time and you're going to be tired and you don't want to commit. Because commitment sometimes may look a little bit scary. But there's nothing more than the enemy would want than to rob you and rob me of the promise that God has for those who are planted in the house of God. The word says that those who are planted in the house, they will flourish. So what I want us to understand this morning, what I want us to get into our hearts if we hear anything today, is that if we avoid the process, then we're going to miss out on the promise. If we avoid the process of getting planted, we're going to never achieve the promise that God has for us that he's going to build our lives. So this morning, God has you in this place and you came to church this morning and maybe you serve on Dream Team and maybe you've allowed your roots to grow deep in this house, in the house of God. And you know everything that's come out of it. You know that God has placed you in a family. You know that God is encouraging you. But maybe you're in this place and you still haven't decided and God is telling you this morning it's time. It's time that you quiet the voices in your mind telling you this isn't for you. Telling you this is for somebody else. Telling you this is for somebody that looks a little bit different than you. I want to tell you this morning that getting planted in the house of God is for you. It is what God wants for your life. Because he knows that the moment you get planted, you will flourish. It doesn't mean life will be perfect. It just means that through it all, you will grow. You will stand that there is a promise waiting for you, but we need to get planted 
and say yes. That yes, being planted means God is going to take us out of our comfort zone. But he wants to do this because he knows that nothing will ever grow in that place. And he doesn't want us to waste our lives away never being planted. And so I love that in these verses we just read, this is the picture that the writer is giving us. He's telling us and comparing those who are planted like that palm tree and that cedar tree. And the reason why he's doing this is because it's a beautiful picture of trees that are planted and the courts of God that are growing strong, steady, bearing fruit. It is trees that are not easily broken. It is trees that will remain. It is trees that are not worried about what's happening around them because they understand that they are planted in the soil of the house of God, which means they will always have what they need, which means that for as long as I am planted in the house of God, I'm going to receive everything that I need to flourish, everything that I need to grow, that I'm not going to lack anything, that I'm not going to be afraid to the rains for the rains. I'm not going to be afraid of when the drought comes because the soil that I'm planted in gives me everything that I need to grow. It happens in the house of God. And so the writer knows the power that's in the house. And I know that much like me, there are some of us in this place that we've experienced firsthand the power that is in the house of God. That when we walk through these doors and we were broken, we experienced the power, the healing power of the church of Jesus Christ. That when we walk through these doors thinking that we couldn't take another step, we experience hope and we experience freedom. That the house of God is not just a place that we go to, but it is a community that we are. That the house of God is not just for walls, but it's the soil in which God will position us to flourish. It happens in the house of God. So as we go through life and as we start to make decisions to get planted, there are things that will begin to happen. And it is that planting process. We get planted and our roots begin to grow. We will begin to grow. Fruit will come out of our lives. And one of the things that will happen as we get planted is that we will experience growth. And growth, it's, it's a nice idea. Sounds good. Everyone wants to grow. Everyone wants to be a better person. Everyone wants to be a better mom, a better dad, a better daughter, a better son, a better leader, a better boss, a better employee. Everyone wants to be a better person up until we realize that it's going to take a little bit of work. Then the idea isn't that nice anymore. And you know what it is, is that if we want to grow, it means we got to stretch. And stretching comes with a little bit of struggle, right? We're stretching. There's something that's being stretched, creating room for something to happen. And I thought about my nephews when they were, I mean, they're still growing, but when they were younger, um, their legs would hurt sometimes. And we had no idea why. And they never, you know, just hurt themselves or whatever. And then we realized that they were just going through a growth spurt and they were experiencing growing pains. And this was due to me. I never experienced growing pains, maybe because I didn't grow too much. But they experienced it. And I, I was such a, I was just, oh, okay. Your bones are stretching. And as they stretch, something begins to happen on the outside. And so I really believe that if we want something in our lives to manifest on the outside, there needs to be something happening on the inside, right? If we want something to happen on the outside of our lives, there's got to be something happening underneath the surface. The reason why trees grow and, and the way that they grow is because of whatever's happening under the surface. But the problem that we've had is that for way too long, we've been too worried about the outside and not about what's happening inside. That we've been living lives where we're wondering just how people perceive us. Where we're worried about the fact that is my picture on Instagram getting enough likes? Are people leaving me comments on Facebook? We're worried about pretending that we have the perfect life, the perfect family. My kids, they don't do what your kids do. My husband, my wife, mm, that doesn't happen in my family. Some of us are already getting our Christmas pictures ready to send out cards to half of the world to let everyone know we've got the perfect family. We're picture perfect. We're worried about what happens on the outside that we've forgotten the inside. And on the outside, it looks like we're thriving. And on the outside, it looks like everything is fine. 
but on the inside we're dying. And on the inside we're lonely and on the inside we're broken and on the inside we're holding on to unforgiveness and on the inside we've been carrying pain and all these problems for way too long. But as long as nobody knows, we're going to be okay. And God wants us to know this morning, I don't care how your outside looks like. I don't care how many degrees you've got hanging on the wall. I don't care the kind of car that you drive when you're dying inside, when you're in desperate need of me. I don't care if your life looks all perfect when in reality you're dying inside. So it's time. It's time that you realize that if you want to do something significant with your life, that if you really want to live out the purpose that God has for you, you need to get planted in the house of God because planted in the house of God you will flourish so we need to stand here this morning and say I'm going to make a decision to put aside all these lies and all these thoughts that have come to my mind and all this doubt and I'm going to say yes to getting planted in the house and I'm going to tell myself and remind myself that God didn't just give me all of this to do nothing with it, but that there's a purpose and a plan for my life. That there's more that God wants for me. We need to let our roots grow deep. Because as they do, we're going to be connected with Jesus. We're going to be connected in community. Our lives will begin to grow. And the depth of our roots will determine our height. The depth of our roots will determine our health. The depth of our roots will determine our strength. But do we have any roots? Are we planted in the house of God? When you do, you're going to find a network of people, a community of people that are going to come alongside you. You may think that we're different, but we're not any different than you. We are people on this journey together waiting for you to commit, to say, I'm going to get planted so that we can come alongside you and say, let's do this together. Come on, we're going to do something. We're going to walk somewhere together. We're going to do this. And uh, just the other day I was reading this article about this ecologist. And she studies certain forests and the trees that grow in those forests. And she realized that under the surface, at the roots, they have these things called their root networks. So basically what this means is that they are connected with each other. And so if one is lacking something, it sends a signal to the other tree, and that other tree can somewhat and somehow through these root networks give the nutrients and the water that that tree needs to communicate and they help each other out. They become a lifeline for each other, which means that the, the, the tree that's been getting all the sunshine, all the water, he's thriving, it's great, can help the tree that hasn't seen the sunlight in a week or two or three, that the tree that's strong and is flourishing can somehow at one moment, in a second, look over to the tree that's been dying because it has no nutrients, no water, and can say, I'm here to help you. And that is exactly the thing that happens in our lives when we get planted in the house of God, that you're no longer by yourself, that you're no longer isolated. Some of us need to get out of isolation today. Some of us need to make that decision and understand that by ourselves we're not going to make it, but that God has created community because some of us can be stronger than somebody else and we can give you a hand and we can tell you I'm here to help you. When you haven't seen the sunlight in a long time, I'm here to tell you that you will, that the time is coming. For you, that we can surround ourselves with people that are going to encourage us and help us and help us flourish in life. And as we do, we're not going to be the same people we used to be. As we get planted and you're in a process, all of a sudden God begins to work in your life. People are going to help you and you're going to begin to see that you're not the same angry person you used to be before. That all of a sudden you're not going to be the same bitter person you used to be before. That all of a sudden you're going to become a better man, a better woman, a better father, a better son, a better wife, a better mother. Because being planted, we flourish. Being planted, we grow. And being planted, we also produce fruit. Which means that there's something that's going to come out of our lives, not just for our own benefit, but for the benefit of people. That God has called us and he has changed our lives. And so now there is fruit in our lives. There is joy. There is love. There is compassion. There is kindness. And now we can stand 
as a lie to other people. Now we can stand and tell other people, my God is good. And if he did this for me, he's going to do it for you, and I'm going to help you. And I'm here to serve you, and I'm here to walk alongside you. I really believe God doesn't just build lives. God builds, builds lives to transform other lives. Right? And, 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 and I don't know about you, but I really can say that God has helped me. That God has saved me, that God has picked me up, that maybe I didn't deserve to be standing here. And I know there are some of you in this place that you can say the same thing, that you can say I was broken, but God, he healed me. I was in, in, in bondage and God set me free. That you can say, hey, I didn't think there was hope for my life, but the second I planted myself in the house of God, all of a sudden I saw that there was more for my life. And when you know that, when you've experienced the goodness of God, the natural response for us is to be able to help somebody else. To be able to say, I'm not going to keep this to myself. I'm actually going to point other people to Jesus. And it leads me to think about our church, our community. This community that is built on the fruit of people. On the fruit of generosity that allows us to keep our doors open every Sunday. On the fruit of the talents of people that lead us into worship every Sunday. That set up lights. That set up screens. The fruit of the people who give up their time, the dream teamers, who come here every morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, to set everything up for us so that we can walk into this place and experience Jesus, no distractions. Everything is set for us. As a community, together, we help people. As a community, together, we feed the homeless. We help the incarcerated. We help the traffic. We help churches in our city. We help church churches in our country. We help churches around the world. We help children around the world. Together, because of our fruit, the world can change. Together, because of our fruit, our lives can be better. Our families can be better. We can make a difference. And that has, God has called you and I to make a difference. And he has changed your life. And with that change of life comes a responsibility. We are responsible to make sure people know about Jesus. We are responsible to make sure that we are at the service of people and of God. He doesn't want us to be just spectators. He wants us to participate. And some people, they, they've done a study in the church and they've, they've come to the conclusion that the church, the current state of the church is an 80-20 which means that only 20% of the people that come to church on Sundays are actually planted. That only 20% of people are carrying the rest. That means that in a room this size, there's 20% of us carrying the 80. There's 20% of us that are making this uh, changes and this difference in the world with the other 80, we're just cruising. And God is telling us, Imagine what could happen. Imagine what would happen if the 80 decided to get off the sidelines and get to work. If the 80 decided to just not show up to church but be the church. If the 80 decided to not just cheer somebody else from the sidelines but get on the ground, on the field and get working. We can change our city. We can change our world. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to just allow 20 to carry me. I don't want to live my life being carried by somebody else. I want my life to be lived in the service of people. I want my life to have a meaning. I want my life to be able to pave a way for somebody else. I want my life to leave a legacy, to make a difference. Imagine what we can do. And God is saying, I don't, I don't want you to go to church. I don't want you to go to church. I, I want you to be the church. I don't want you to come out on a Sunday and check it off a list. You're not doing me a favor, but when you get planted, you're going to grow. This isn't about me. You're not doing anything for me. When you get planted in the house, you're going to grow. Your life will produce fruit. Your life will be better. Your life will be blessed. Your life will flourish. Planted in the house of God. In John chapter 15, Jesus says to his disciples, he says, this is... To my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. I wonder if we're willing to get planted today. I wonder if we're willing to allow our roots to grow deep and to allow God to do something special in our lives. 
if maybe this morning we decide that we're not just going to come in and out, but that we're going to get planted. That we're going to be part of the people that are making a difference in the city and around the world. The last thing that's going to happen as we get planted is that we're going to leave a legacy. And I love the way that this verse puts it. It talks about those that are planted and it says that they will still bear fruit in old age. That they will stay fresh and green and they will always proclaim that the Lord is upright, that the Lord is the rock and that there is no wickedness in him. This is the fulfillment of the promise for those who are planted in the house of God. That as years pass by, you will still bear fruit. That as years pass by, you're still going to stand as a testimony of the goodness of Jesus. And I love this imagery that, the, that these verses give us. They, they allow us to just close our eyes and imagine the house of God, the church, the temple. And imagine these beautiful, massive trees growing there. And what he's trying to do with this is, is put some things into context here. Is allow us to see something else. The, the other day I... I had to, um, Alex and I had to pull some weeds from the front yard of our house. Talking about plants, right? So I thought I was going to hate this whole thing and it's going to be so hard and I don't want to do this, right? So whatever, we go. And the second that I begin to pull the weeds, I realize this is very easy. Like you just, they just come right off, right? And, and I was like, okay, this isn't bad. And you know what I realized? That by God showing us this imagery of these trees, what he's telling us is that our lives don't have to be like the weeds. That get easily uprooted at the sign of any push, any pull in our lives. That at the moment that anything begins to do some, some stretch in our lives that we're just going to come right off. That he wants us to be like these trees planted in the house of God. You know the thing about weeds is that they grow fast but they go fast. The, things about, the thing about weeds is that they grow fast but they never give, they only take. There's no life in them. They take from other people. They take from what's around them. And so God is saying, I don't want you to be like the weeds that only take and never give. I don't want you to be weak like the weeds. I want you to stand strong, planted with your roots in the soil of the house of Jesus Christ. Because when the winds and the storms come, you may sway a little bit, you may move a little bit, but you're not going to be broken. You're not going to be uprooted. Your situations and your circumstances are not going to kill you. They're not going to destroy your life because you are planted in good soil. Because your roots are planted in the house of God. Because your roots have been planted in a place where you can grow. In a place where I have shown you there's purpose for your life. And maybe some of us don't think about the old age. Maybe some of us think we're in the old age, but whatever the case might be. You know what I love? I love that in the house of God, I have found people like that palm tree and like that cedar tree that have stood with their lives planted in the house of God as a living testimony of the goodness of God. That when my life gets tough, I can look to them and be inspired. That when my life gets tough, I can look to them and say, if God did it for you, he's going to do it for me. That when life gets hard, I can look to you and say, you serve a God that is good. I serve the same God. Of people that have allowed me to get on their shoulders and see that there's much more for me. People that have planted their roots and with their roots, they've paved a way of faith for me. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to live a meaningless life. I don't want to live a life that the day that I die, it's gone. But I want to live a life that is building something that will outlast me. I want to build a life that is building something that the generations to come can look back and say, I want to serve the God. I serve the God of Diana. I serve the God of Michael. I serve the God of Stephanie. A good God. A God that provides. A God that is for me. A God that's not going to leave me. That when they see our lives, they can look back and say, like them, I will proclaim the goodness of God. That when I am old and gray and my body begins to get weak, my spirit and my soul will stay fresh and green. 
my spirit and my soul will still speak of the goodness of God. Because we have a good God, but it happens planted in the house of God. It is planted in the house of God that my life has changed. It is planted in the house of God that God has stretched my life and allowed me to see that there's purpose. It is in the house of God that God has planted me and surrounded me with people that have helped me, that have encouraged me, that have believed in me. It is planted in the house where God has allowed me to be that for somebody else. I wonder if you're planted here today. And if you're not, I just want to encourage you to take your next step. God wants you to take a next step. Not for him, not for me. Church is going to happen next week with or without you. But he's giving us an opportunity to say, I want to be a part of what you are doing, God. I don't want to miss out on the goodness. I don't want to miss out on your promise. I don't want to miss out on the things that you have for me, God. My gifts and my talents, I don't want to waste them. I want to put them to use and bear much fruit. So I wonder what lies are in your mind, what thoughts running in your mind, maybe making you feel like this is for somebody else, maybe making you feel that you're not good enough, the call is for you. And as you take one step, God's going to carry you and help you to take the next one. And as you take one step, your roots will begin to grow. And next thing you know, you're not going to want to be any other place but planted in the house of God. So whatever that next step is, I want to encourage you today as you leave, go to the connect area. Talk to somebody. Tell somebody where you're at in life and allow us to help you. Because I've seen a lot of people going to church, always saying the same, but I've never seen a person planted in the house remaining the same. There's more for you. Come on, can we get up on our feet this morning?